filming the day now, which is why the lighting has completely changed. But wow, the lighting's really nice. Bella! Maybe I should film in the day more. Big one. The next big attempt to try and solve James's financial problems was in 1610 with the Great Contract, which was Robert Cecil who organised it. And the deal initially was in return for an annual grant, so money each year, of £200,000 and a £600,000 one-off debt payment. The cash is there anyway. And then the Crown would abolish things such as wardships, purveyance, feudal tenures, etc. And then the deal was agreed after a month of negotiation, but they had to change it a little bit. So Commons agreed to pay £100,000 as a grant and then would get £200,000 a year. Another big part of this compromise was the imposition bill, which Commons wanted as well, which was where James had a set list of impositions he could have and then he couldn't, he was restricted in making any more. So ultimately, the idea was based on a compromise where James could keep some things that he wanted so he could keep his initial impositions but he just couldn't implement anymore and then parliament also maintains taxation control by knowing where the money's coming from and they get to control it and where it goes as well but ultimately this failed because James realised and his team realised that he would lose £115,000 a year and also he wanted the freedom to exploit impositions as they were a big part of his finance and also he wanted things like revenues where they could dress it clear change in price over time and then also parliament didn't want to fund james's extravagance and i think they feared no and i think they feared that by him getting like a yearly 200 200 pound revenue from parliament that he would spend on himself and to his scottish friends and so they wanted to avoid that really and then mps were particularly concerned over impositions because they questioned the legality. So yeah, they feared that James would spend the money irresponsibly, the money they got. He called him a leaky cistern, so like a tap where he gets the money in and then he just pours it all out again on extravagance and stuff for himself and stuff for his friends. So I mean, ultimately, you can look at this big contract as something that would have been quite successful, you would think, and it should have prevented any conflicts in the future, or less conflicts. But it failed and it kind of proves that kind of like there was an underlying tension anyway just between like the king and parliament and distrust. Like it wasn't just about the money itself. It was about the distrust between parliament and James where they didn't trust him to have control of money and control over how it can be spent. I think if I just quickly talk about impositions again because that was definitely a big source of tension. Because the thing about impositions is that it's a tax for trade but it doesn't need parliamentary consent and it goes straight to James, it goes straight to the Crown. So I think MPs specifically, and you can see that in the Great Contract when they wanted this bill, they were worried about James having so much power over taxation. Like, I think they questioned the legality of James being able to collect taxes this way. And also it meant after the Bates case, people didn't believe that was like sufficient evidence to say that impositions were legal and James could live with them just whenever he wanted and with how many he wanted. There were still concerns over that, which was a great source of tension. The way that James tried to get more money was through custom farmers, which was instead of customs being paid directly to the Crown, the Crown could kind of give the right for individual people or like companies to collect the tax themselves so it could be sold by the Crown to people, to merchants specifically. And so it was good because it encouraged these um, custom farmers to be very diligent in collecting it because they would get any excess profit. So it kind of encouraged them to try and collect it properly and to the full extent. And also it was a good source of patronage for James. So it was a way to kind of get people connected to the crown and get them loyal to the crown. Oh, you are so beautiful. Custom farmers were also good because it gave James a regular source of income because it would be paid on like a, not sure, like a monthly or yearly basis, but it wasn't like customs coming in out randomly. It was you know, a set amount each month, so it meant he could regulate his spending a lot better. But then there were some cons, so such as if trade boomed, then the custom farmers would profit a lot from it at the expense of the Crown. And also it was another source of tension between Parliament because they saw it as a way that they were being denied control of taxation because again they had no influence over this. 
Another way from 1612 onwards, after the death of Robert Cecil, James tried to collect money was through selling titles. So, for example, he started by selling knighthoods and he also made up a title called Baronet, which could be sold for no £1,000 to buy, but then they became problematic where not many people bought them. It was no more than 200 people, but it meant that they lost their like prestige and their value. So the market ultimately saturated, so the price fell significantly from £1,000 to £220. So that became useless. It stopped making any profit. And then after 1615 and the failure of the adult parliament, which I'll get to in the video on the parliaments, James then started to sell earldoms. And then the number of earls ultimately rose from 28 to 65. So it rose from 28, the number of earls rose from 28 in 1615 to 65 in 1628. So that did raise a lot of money ultimately, I think it was a successful effort from James. But then there were some problems where a lot of the money that was raised fell straight into the hands of the courtiers again, so they would just spend it on themselves. It was still quite a corrupt system. And also it angered a lot of people, I think also rightfully so, because they always think that titles like these should be awarded on merit and not just given because you've got enough money to buy them essentially. It kind of loses the point of it. The next attempt at helping the financial situation in oh, be, ah, the next attempt in ah. the next attempt to reform the financial situation in England came from a merchant called cocaine I think you say it I'll put the name up there and it was his scheme in 1614 and he persuaded the king to prohibit the selling of unfinished cloth to the Netherlands because they had this little system where they would sell unfinished cloth to the Netherlands and then they would finish it off they would do the dyes etc but he thought if they only sold finished cloth, then they could make much more of a profit from it because it'd be finished, so it'd be worth more. And also it would increase employment in England and like a new way for England to make money where they could like start a dyeing business of cloth. Yeah, ultimately this failed because they couldn't find the capital, they couldn't find anywhere to sell this finished cloth to because the Netherlands just changed their trade and they just bought unfinished cloth from elsewhere so they could continue their dyeing industry so that didn't work and also nobody in England was really experienced in dyeing cloth so even at home they couldn't find the market to dye the cloth so ultimately the scheme failed and James gave up on it by 1618. Another way that James tried to make money, it becomes more important in Charles's reign but with something called monopolies so if you have an like if I had a monopoly of forks I'd be the only person who could sell forks so having a monopoly gives that person the sole right to sell that product and it was something that could be bought from the crown so you could buy the monopoly of forks from the crown and then only you could sell forks which was productive in the sense that it meant people could make a substantial amount of money from that because there was no competition so if i said forks are 100 pounds yes that was really excessive but if you really need a fork you can only buy it from me so you have to pay the 100 pounds for the fork and then profit but then there were some problems with it, but it caused a lot of tensions because people didn't like it because it meant that they were paying too much for products in some cases. So it was something else that Commons wanted to abolish. The final thing that we can look at is Cranfield, who was Lord Treasurer from 1621. And he had, I think he generally did want to reform the financial situation. He had a policy where he wanted to increase revenue and then cut down expenditure. So get more money coming in but then less coming out on stupid things. So he attempted to control James' generosity, similar to what Cecil did with the Book of Bounty. So he wanted to screen our grants, so we could only, he had to decide whether the cottages could get these grants or not, to try and reduce how much money James is giving unnecessarily. But ultimately, I think he was successful. Like he cut down on spending in a lot of different areas, so like in places like the Navy, in the household, in the car, and stuff like that. From the Navy, the household and the wardrobe, he saved £150,000 a year, which was better than what anybody else had done so far. He also received a declaration from James in 1622, where he promised that he wouldn't give any more grants of big items or things like that and stuff like that. However, this didn't really happen because it's James and he loves to give stuff away. So like Buckingham asked for £30,000 for a new house, James was like, 
sure. So ultimately he was relatively successful, but this was completely undermined because of foreign policy and Cranfield didn't want to support a war with Spain, which was becoming popular. We'll talk about that later on with Buckingham and Charles. He didn't want to support this because he knew it would be detrimental to the Crown's finances, which he had tried so hard to reform. And so this ultimately led him to be impeached by Charles and Buckingham, who wanted war with Spain and opposed anybody who didn't want this war. I think James was unhappy about this, but he didn't do anything significant to stop it because he was influenced too much by his son and his favourite. I think that's the main point for James and finance, but just at the end of James' reign, essentially nothing has been held and royal finances are still really uncontrolled. Debt was getting towards a million pounds, so Charles is going to be the one now who had to deal with this and we'll see how he does in later videos. Thank you for watching.